Hey everybody, welcome back to General Biochemistry Lecture. We are starting Chapter 13. This is the Introduction to Metabolism. So we're going to go over some common reaction mechanisms and some common themes that we're going to see throughout the chapters where we talk about metabolism. We're going to introduce some vocabulary, of course. And this is where we're going to start to push some electrons around. So you're going to need to be able to draw some of these reaction mechanisms. And I'll point out the ones that I want you to understand and be able to replicate and, you know, draw afresh on an exam or an assignment. This chapter is kind of big. So there's going to be two videos. This first one, we're covering sections two and three. We're not covering section one. We're starting with section two. We're going to talk about the first, um, so sections two and three, and then the second chapter 13 video will cover the remainder of the chapter, which is sections four and five. So make sure that you watch both of these and you start with this one. If you're already here, then I guess you already know the deal, right? Okay. As usual, here are the key principles. Um, you'll see these uh, for the whole entire chapter. So you're not going to see this slide again in the second video um, but make sure that you can after going through the entire chapter go back to this and kind of understand where these principles are coming from and expand on them let's talk a little bit about some vocabulary about metabolism so within metabolism there's catabolic and anabolic pathways catabolism is where you're degrading things right so you're releasing energy you ate something it's got protein it's got fat it's got carbohydrates and you're breaking that down you're going to make all kinds of things you're going to make some energy along the way you're going to expel expel like carbon dioxide and things like that because those are byproducts but you're going to fuel the creation of fuel. Anabolism is biosynthesis. So you're taking all of the precursor molecules like amino acids, sugars, fatty acids, all the things, and you are building all those macromolecular uh, players that we just finished talking about in uh, chapters 7, 8, and 10. You're building proteins, you're building polysaccharides, you know, the glycogen. You're building lipids, you're building nucleic acids, and all of these things require energy. So you've got one leg of metabolism that creates energy, and then the other leg which uses up some of that energy to make the building blocks that you need to grow and to replenish and replace things. And that together is metabolism. What you'll notice is that catabolic pathways converge, which means that eventually they all kind of, if you keep breaking things down, breaking things down, the goal is to eventually make acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is a very, very versatile molecule. It can be broken down in the citric acid cycle to make more energy, which is shown below. Or you can take that and start to build it up again. And then you're making all of your big macromolecules like lipids and things like that. So that's just an example of how catabolic pathways converge to make a very useful high energy molecule that could also be used to build up. Now let's get started. First, we're going to talk about kind of chemical logic and very common biochemical reactions. Some of these reactions may look a little bit familiar because organic chemistry, you're learning reactions. But sometimes the biological emphasis is lacking because it's organic chemistry. You're not necessarily talking about biochemistry. But there are a lot of examples of organic chemistry mechanisms that you can apply to biochem. So there's five general categories of reactions in living cells, and we're going to go through all of these one by one. But this is just to help you kind of 
have a way of sorting all the different reactions that we're going to see in metabolism in the coming chapters. So we've got reactions that make or break carbon bonds, internal rearrangements, isomerizations and eliminations. So that's kind of like rearranging the furniture. Free radical reactions, group transfers, which is a really important one, and then redox, which is oxidation reductions, but I don't want to say all of that. That's a mouthful. So I'm going to say redox, just to let you know. We'll start with talking about making and breaking carbon bonds. So more terminology. This is going to be a term heavy portion. So if organic chemistry wasn't your jam, you'll definitely want to kind of listen up, open up both ears and get started on this material early so that when you have questions, you can come to office hours. So in general, there's homolytic cleavage and heterolytic cleavage. Homolytic cleavage is where each atom that leaves the bond, so you have this, this bond, right? So we'll use some colors here just to make it, just to make it a little bit happier. We've got the carbon and we've got the hydrogen. When you break this bond and it's a homolytic cleavage, that means the carbon is like, look, I'm taking my 50%. They've gotten a divorce. The carbon has said, look, I'm taking 50%. You can have your 50%. They each get an electron. So they're carrying around one unpaired electron. You can also have this between carbons where each carbon that was a part of a bond now has this unpaired electron and they're both carbon radicals. Now you can imagine that this would be pretty unstable. So when you're trying to do any kind of cleavage where you have some electrons, you know, you're making an anion or a cation, an enzyme is going to have to stabilize that form and push it through to the other side to make the product. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So that's homolytic cleavage. Each one gives 50%. So that's a split down the middle divorce, okay? Heterolytic cleavage, think about that as there was a prenup, okay? There was a prenuptial agreement that said, look, I made this, so I'm keeping it, even if we split. So you have this bond that's broken, and one atom gets all of the electrons, the other one gets none. So if you're breaking a bond between a carbon and a hydrogen, then you can make a hydride, which is just a hydrogen that has electrons. Or you can have um, you know, a carbon-carbon bond, and you've got one carbanion that's got two electrons, and a carbocation, which is positively charged. Heterolytic cleavage is much more common when we're talking about biological reactions. So that's the one that you should definitely know. Now we'll add some more terminology to this. Nucleophiles and electrophiles, which we talked, I've used the term nucleophile before in talking about, um, you know, in class, some of the case studies that we've done and talking about amino acids and enzymes, and especially enzyme kinetics can't help but use some of the terminology. But now we'll give you some more formal definitions. So a nucleophile is a functional group that is rich in electrons and it is able to donate some. Okay. Nucleophiles are looking for electrophiles, which are deficient in electrons and they need some extra. So you pair together a nucleophile with an electrophile and you get a good reaction. Carbon can actually act as either a nucleophile or an electrophile. On the right hand side, we see some different examples of nucleophiles. Oxygen, highly negative, and it has electrons for days that it can spare. You'll see oxygen very commonly as an electrophile with um, water. You'll also see it with some of the amino acids that have hydroxyls, so serine, threonine, you get the idea.
You can also have a sulfhydryl group, so think cysteine, with the sulfur that is negative. Then that carbanion that we talked about where we have heterolytic cleavage and you've got a carbon that's got two electrons, so a pair of electrons that it needs to do something with. An imidazole ring, which has an amine that has a lone pair. So this ring should look very familiar because it's part of histidine, right? So that nitrogen here, so this, this carbon-nitrogen bond um, helps to stabilize some of that charge, right? And that lone pair can go out and attack something. And then, of course, the hydroxide ion. Then the electrophiles. Very common one that you'll see is the carbonyl carbon. It has a partial positive on it. So it is ready to be attacked. <laughs> and then the protonated imine group. So an imine, if you remember your functional groups, is a carbon double bonded to a nitrogen. And... If that double bond exists and it also has a hydrogen bound, then that nitrogen is positively charged. That carbon, however, is still not as electronegative as the nitrogen, and it is ripe for nucleophilic attack. Phosphorus, same deal. And then, of course, a hydrogen can be snatched away from things, like water. So these are common nucleophiles and electrophiles. It would definitely benefit you to remember these so when you're on the prowl looking at you know a, a molecule trying to figure out whether or not it has a nucleophile or an electrophile where could something attack this will help you yep. we went backwards instead of forwards sometimes that happens one step back two step forwards here we go so we need to be able to make this carbanion with heterolytic cleavage and stabilize it, you're also going to make a carbocation. You need to stabilize that. You need to combine these two things to form a carbon-carbon bond. So we can break them. We can also form them. But when it comes to biochem, it's really, those things are really unstable. Okay. Carbanions, carbocations, very unstable, very difficult to do reaction with this. So how do we do it? Well, if we know that the carbonyl carbon is an electrophilic carbon, well, groups that are next to those, you can kind of form that carbanion internally inside of the molecule and then the electrons are positioned to where they can attack and you can form whatever double bond or um, you know, break whatever bond that needs to be broken right there. So instead of having trying to hang on to a carbocation and a carbanion, you have all of it in the same molecule. And the resonance structures within that molecule, once you form that, um, carbon ion will help to stabilize it along with all of the residues in the active site. So A through D, we're looking at one, the carbonyl carbon and the fact that it has a partial positive charge. So that if you have some kind of a carbon ion, you can have resonance. and that stabilizes this structure. The same thing for an imine. There's resonance here so that when you have that carbanion, you can delocalize electrons to a nitrogen or an oxygen and that will stabilize things. To add to the fire, you usually have some kind of a metal or a general acid coordinating that oxygen that's part of the carbonyl, um, the ketone group. So if you have either of those things, 
then you are going to further enhance this reaction because you're like, hey, this is an even bigger partial positive charge. So come on and attack me, please. Kind of guiding the reaction and guiding the electrons to the right place. Here's some common reactions that form and break carbon-carbon bonds. All of these you have probably seen in OCHEM. So aldol condensation, Claisen condensation, and decarboxylation. These are all reactions that go through a carbanion intermediate, and they're stabilized by the presence of a carbonyl group so that you can have some resonance and you can form that double bond. I'm not going to go through and push all of the electrons here, and I'm not going to require you to do that either for these. But I do want you to recognize when a reaction is an aldol condensation or a Claisen ester condensation. Um, I want you to recognize these types of reactions and be able to point them out. So carbocation intermediates are generated by the elimination of a really good leaving group like a pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate is just two inorganic phosphates that are connected together. So this right here is a pyrophosphate. You'll also see it abbreviated PPI. This reaction um, on the right hand side is just an example of using pyrophosphate as a leaving group to generate geronal pyrophosphate. So you're combining two different um, compounds to create this elongated lipid. Next category, internal re rearrangements, isomerizations, and eliminations. I call this kind of rearranging the furniture, right? So you're kind of shifting some groups around. Maybe you're getting rid of water, you know, something like that. So you're redistributing the electrons, but you're not changing the overall oxidation state of the molecule. And that's the big key, he key here. You're not changing the overall oxidation state. You're just rearranging the furniture. And so these reactions include intramolecular oxidation reduction reactions, or redox. So that's internally within the molecule. You can have a change from cis to trans arrangement for a double bond. And remember, cis, you have all of the non-hydrogen um, constituent groups on the same side. Trans, they're on opposite sides. You can also have the transposition of double bonds. So just moving a double bond around. We'll start with elimination reactions. So here, you're going to lose water to form a double bond between two carbons. And this can happen using water as um, as a nucleophile, or you can use, um, you know, something from that's part of an active site in an amino, in an enzyme. So an amino acid that can do this. But pretty much what has to happen is you have to somehow remove this hydrogen. So that you form a an anion and then you somehow also need to eliminate this as water by having it grab a proton and so you release a water again I'm not going to have you push the electrons for this but I want you to recognize when an elimination reaction has occurred you can do the same thing with the means. It doesn't have to be an alcohol. This is an example of one of these elimination reactions. That's also an isomerization reaction because we're just rearranging um, where a double bond is. So we're starting with glucose 6-phosphate. And we're going to use an enzyme called phosphohexose isomerase 
to change that to fructose 6 phosphate. First part of this mechanism, you have to have a base that abstracts a proton, which means it takes away a proton. Then you're going to form a double bond. So these electrons, you can see the arrow, go into forming a double bond. But a carbon can't have any more than four bonds. So some of the electrons between that carbon and the oxygen, well, that oxygen is going to say, hey, okay, I'll just grab another hydrogen. That's fine. And it becomes a hydroxyl group because there's another base that is able to donate a proton. Okay. So that base is, it's got a hydrogen bound and it can donate. But then that second base says, oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to keep my hydrogen. That was just on loan. So you need to give me that back. So it's got to be a strong base. It's going to take back that same hydrogen. Well, it's not the same hydrogen. It's a hydrogen. It's going to take off the hydrogen from the hydroxyl group that you want to you know, form the double bond with. So you're going to lose a hydrogen to that base. And you're pretty much doing the same thing in reverse. Okay, So you steal a hydrogen, collapse down to make that double bond. So you remake that ketone on a different carbon. And then these electrons here will go out and grab that hydrogen that was on base one. So you've rearranged, you've swapped where the, the ketone and the, hy the hydroxyl groups are. So it was an elimination reaction, but it was also an isomerization reaction. Next group, free radicals. Okay, Homolytic cleavage of a covalent bond will generate free radicals. And that does happen in some metabolic pathways. So remember, homolytic cleavage means that when you break the bond, each atom that was a part of that bond carries away a, um, an unpaired electron. Very unstable, less likely to happen, but it does happen in biological symptoms. Or s symptoms? My tongue must be tired. Systems. That's the word I was going for there. Okay. The next group of reactions is group transfer reactions and you'll see these a lot they are all over metabolism you can transfer an acyl group a glycosyl group which is just a glucose phosphoryl group from one nucleophile to another with an acyl group transfer you're adding a nucleophile to the carbonyl carbon of an acyl group and you're forming a tetrahedral intermediate in between. So let's say that you have, this is a nucleophile here, Y, and it sees this carbonyl carbon that has a partial positive charge. It's going to attack that carbonyl carbon and then a pair of electrons from the double bond between the carbon and the oxygen is going to go up to the oxygen and then it's going to have a negative charge in that tetrahedral intermediate that will then collapse back down and you're going to get rid of whatever X is. And now, instead of having R and X, you're going to have R and Y and you generate a new nucleophile. So that can go and get a hydrogen or it can do some other chemistry. But that is the basic um, group transfer reaction. So you will need to be able to push some electrons for this one. Phosphoryl group transfers are very, very common and you'll need to understand these. So for this group, you'll need to be able to do it. Phosphoryl groups are really good leaving groups. They also can, if you add a phosphate to something, that's called activating it because down the line that phosphoryl group can be cleaved. 
The addition of phosphoryl groups is catalyzed by kinases. So what you're seeing here on the right is we're looking at, in part A, we're looking at all of the resonance structures of phosphate. And then we're also looking at the geometry in B. C gives you an example of a phosphoryl transfer. So we have ATP, which is a nucleotide, but remember, it is energy currency in the cell. If you have a glucose, glucose has all of those hydroxyl groups that can act as nucleophiles and attack one of the phosphates that's part of ATP. So you can have a glucose that is phosphorylated and that's activating it and trapping it in the cell. So what is a kinase? This is just more terminology here. A kinase is an enzyme that transfers a phosphoryl group from ATP to something else. So what the reaction is called a phosphorylation reaction. Phosphorylase does something similar, but the key difference between a kinase and a phosphorylase is that pho phosphorylases, they're breaking a bond and then replacing something with a phosphate. So they're breaking a bond, adding a phosphate group. That's different from a kinase where it's just transferring a phosphate to something else. And of course, we have to have an enzyme that does the reverse reaction. Phosphorylation is used all over the place to regulate enzyme activity, to regulate protein-protein um, interactions, and all the things. So we have to be able to modulate phosphorylation. And phosphatases remove that phosphoryl group. So they catalyze dephosphorylation reactions. We've also got a lot more ACEs to cover, okay? and you will need to know the difference between these. So synthases, they catalyze condensation reactions where you don't need a nucleotide triphosphate. So read that as ATP or GTP. Those are, those are the two that are generally used in the cell. You can use any for uh, donating you know, a phosphate to a group or making a reaction more favorable by coupling it with um, one of those reactions. So a synthase doesn't need any kind of nucleotide. A synthetase does. So they do the same kind of reaction, only synthetases require ATP or GTP or something like that. Then we've got ligases. They catalyze condensation reactions where two atoms are joined using some kind of energy source. And then lyases, they catalyze cleavages or additions where you're doing some kind of electronic rearrangement. Don't worry, I've got more aces for you. We've got oxidases, and they catalyze biological redox reactions where oxygen is the electron acceptor, and it doesn't actually appear in the oxidized product. Then within that, you've got mixed function oxidases, which oxidize two different substrates simultaneously. You don't need to know about that. But they exist. So that's just for your for your understanding, but you don't need to know that. Then we've got oxygenases, and they perform redox reactions as well. Oxygen is the electron acceptor, and that oxygen actually appears in the oxidized product. You've got monooxygenases where you incorporate one oxygen atom, and then dioxygenases, which you incorporate two.
again, I'm not going to make you know that specifically. Just know that the broader group of oxygenases versus oxidases. We also have dehydrogenases, and they catalyze redox reactions where NAD is the electron acceptor and oxygen isn't involved at all. So NAD, NADPH, NADH, um, those are molecules. They're also energy molecules in the cell, and they are involved in redox reactions. So we'll see those in metabolism as well. So we talked about all these different enzymes that can do redox reactions. We need to show a little bit of what that looks like. You're not going to be required to draw redox reactions, but you do need to understand them a bit. So remember that carbon atoms can exist in different oxidation states, and it's totally dependent upon which elements they're sharing a bond with. So if you're sharing a bond with hydrogen versus sharing you know, a double bond with an oxygen, those are very different in terms of the, you know, the sharing aspect of the electrons and the shape. So the most oxidized that you can have a carbon atom is if it's in something like carbon dioxide, it is the most oxidized. The least oxidized is an alkane. So it's a carbon with just a bunch of hydrogens, right? In bio, you'll see a lot of oxidation reactions where you're going to lose electrons and lose a couple of electrons and a couple of hydrogens. And these are catalyzed by dehydrogenases. And remember, those don't use oxygen. So they use NAD or NADP, and they can take up some, hy some hydrogens. They can also donate electrons. So they're very versatile molecules. Sometimes the carbon atom becomes bound to an oxygen, and in that case, you're using an oxidase or an oxygenase. Redox is always going to involve the loss or gain of electrons. For um, So you're going to take a substrate, you're either going to take away electrons, or you're going to give it some electrons and form something new. So there's always going to be something that gains and is reduced. There's always going to be something that loses and is oxidized. And the way that I learned how to keep those two things straight is Leo, the lion, says Gur. So Leon, or Leo stands for lose electrons, oxidize, Gur, gain electrons, reduce. There's some other, um, you know, ways to remember this, but that's how I remembered it from, like, high school. So it stuck with me for all these years that Leo the Lion says Gur. However you learned it, however you can keep it straight, use that, let it work for you. Oxidation reactions typically release energy. So when you think about oxidizing fuel like carbohydrates and fat, you're releasing energy. That's the whole goal of oxidizing fuel in the first place. So when we're talking about all of these reactions in the body and you see some kind of equation, those equations are not necessarily balanced in the same way that a chemical equation is. So biochemical equations don't actually balance for hydrogens. They don't balance for magnesium, you know, or metals, you know, we're not describing the state of phosphate ionization. We're not giving all that detail. We're kind of just saying, in general, this is what happens, but there's a whole lot of steps here that happen in between. But this is the end product. You start with this, you end with this. It may not necessarily be 100% balanced. Chemical equations account for all of the atoms and all the charges and all the things so that one side, you count up all the atoms and everything else, and it's exactly equal to the other side. Biochem, because things aren't that straightforward when you're looking at these reactions, we said, look, we don't have to have all of this balanced nonsense in our equations. We're just going to give you the, the overview. You know, this is a TLDR.
If you want more than that, then you you need to do some more digging. Okay. So that was 13.2. I know, it was a long section. Now we're going to focus more on phosphor group transfers and ATP because this is, again, this is rampant in metabolism. We use ATP and other phosphate um, donating molecules all the time. So ATP is a very special chemical because it links catabolism and anabolism. You can get a lot of energy, right? by just using ATP to couple it to an endergonic reaction. So you convert ATP to ADP and an inorganic phosphate, or you can break it down further. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But you do that reaction, and it is very, very extergonic. So you couple that with an endergonic reaction to make it go just like you would need to do for anabolism. You're trying to build things. Building things requires energy. So you're going to couple it with something that's very exergonic so that you have the energy to do the building. So the energy you obtain from catabolism is used to make ATP. So we'll talk about that process. You eat all the, micro, you know, the glucose and protein and all the things and you eventually end up making ATP, then that ATP gets used up to make all the building blocks that you need. Free energy is something that we've mentioned a lot. And the free energy change for ATP hydrolysis is very big and very negative, which is what we need. The bond that's between all of these oxygens and phosphates, so here and here, those are phosphoanhydrides. Okay. And when you start to break these, you can release a lot of energy. Part of the reason why breaking these bonds is so favorable is because you've got a lot of negative charge all focused on one side of this molecule. All of these oxygens that have unpaired electrons, lone pairs, that's a lot of negative charge. Once you break one, then you're relieving some of that tension. So there's less negative charge all clustered together, which is favorable. Now, normally we just see in a reaction ATP, but the truth is with all that negative charge, you actually have to have some metal to stabilize it. When you have ATP in the cytosol or ADP, which is when you lose one phosphate group, and so there's only two, the D is for diphosphate, you're gonna see that bound to magnesium ions. So the real substrate where you're using ATP or ADP is magnesium bound to this. And that helps to reduce some of that negative charge. The actual phosphorylation potential varies from cell to cell and it varies over time. And the energy that's released by ATP hydrolysis is actually greater than the standard free energy change. Because remember, standard free energy change, I mean, for biochem, we are talking about pH 7. There's a lot of other things going on in the cell than just ATP hydrolysis. And that is why the, you know, energy released is greater. So... The levels of ATP in the cell are actually pretty high in comparison to what you would need for kind of an equilibrium, you know, to, for hydrolysis. So if you were just to have the hydrolysis reaction going on and there's an equilibrium between ATP and the hydrolysis products, the concentration of ATP would actually be pretty low. But our bodies actually maintain a higher level of ATP because we need it. So if we had really low ATP levels, then the amount of energy that you have available to do work 
drastically decreases. And cells are very dynamic. They need to react to stimuli very quickly. So if you need to suddenly start making a bunch of compounds, then you need to have the energy available to do so. Also, when you don't have as much ATP around, it loses its potency. So you need to have a lot of ATP so that you can hydrolyze it and make a lot of energy. If you don't have a lot, then you're not making a lot of energy. So it's one of those keep the energy levels high so that when we need it, we can expend it and then replenish it. There are other phosphorylated compounds, and there's also thioesters, so things that have sulfur, sulfur groups, that also have large negative free energies. But by and large, we focus on ATP a lot because it's used so much. One of the things that stabilizes, um, you know, the phosphate group is the fact that it has all those resonant structures. So all of this, you know, hydrolyzing the a phosphate or a pyrophosphate, there's stabilization, all of these things that contribute to this process being very, uh, having a negative delta G. We're going to look at the hydrolysis of some very important molecules. All of these that I show you, um, you'll need to be able to push the electrons for. So make sure that you can do that. We'll get a little practice in class. This first one we're looking at, the hydrolysis of phosphoenol pyruvate, or PEP. You'll see this in glycolysis. This is the final step to make pyruvate, which is the goal of glycolysis. It's got a high standard free energy because the reaction occurs with a gain in entropy. Okay, You're making two things, and those... And the pyruvate can actually tautomerize, and that leads to greater resonance stabilization. So you have resonance stabilization in the phosphate ion that's released, and also in the pyruvate that is formed. So again, you'll need to be able to push some electrons, knowing that you have a water attack, and cleave that bond. So you'll be responsible just for this first part, okay? So push some electrons around and see, make sure that you can actually get from PEP to pyruvate. And if you can do that, then you should be able to do all these others. So bisphosphoglycerate is another uh, metabolite in glycolysis. We also saw it when we were talking about hemoglobin. This is the BPG that we're talking about. It's got resonance forms just like the pyruvate does. So there's stabilization here. And removal of that phosphate is favored. There's also phosphocreatine, and this is one of the molecules that when your body needs to replenish ATP very quickly, it's going to go to using some creatine to create that ATP. You'll need to be able to push electrons to show this reaction, and then you'll also need to, for all of these, be able to draw the resonance structures. So the resonance structures just show how you can um, rearrange the electronics so that, okay, in this molecule, we've got a, an imine here. You should be able to push the electrons to show, okay, I can have an imine here, or I can have an imine here. So you should be able to draw those resonance structures as well. That's kind of Gen Chem, O Chem um, fundamentals. And if you are having a problem with that, then definitely let me know. One last one that's important is the hydrolysis of acetyl CoA. Uh, CoA is a coenzyme. 
that is very, very important for a lot of different things. And we'll see it come up as a cofactor. So thioesters, they have a sulfur atom instead of the oxygen in the ester bond. And this CoA is actually a really big molecule, but the abbreviation CoA is a lot easier to write. So that's actually like, think of it as like a handle or something that you can hold on to a molecule by. This carbonyl carbon is still partially positive and you can hydrolyze to form free CoA and as an acetic acid. We're going to actually see this reaction when we go through beta oxidation and lipid metabolism. You should be able to draw this one as well. You should also understand, and this is again kind of like gen chem, if I gave you a certain amount of moles of say acetyl-CoA and I said how much energy will I make you should be able to use this number that tells you the amount of energy per mole to convert from energy from you know a constant an amount like moles to energy released so We've got thioesters and we've got oxygen esters. Thioesters don't have the luxury of resonance stabilization like oxygen esters do. So you can't have the, you know, sharing. Usually we see this kind of drawing of all these dotted lines here to show res resonance stabilization, that partial double bond character. That doesn't exist with thioesters. So we don't see that as much, but they're absolutely present in biology. But it's actually much easier to use an oxygen ester. They're much more stable. So ATP provides energy using group transfers, not by hydrolysis. So what that means is if we're looking at an enzyme that is going to use ATP, what's actually going to happen is first that ATP is going to activate an amino acid on an enzyme first. So you'll see an enzyme and maybe it'll just be if you're trying to transfer a phosphate group then you'll have a phosphate transferred from ATP to the enzyme. So that's this first step here. This is your enzyme bound phosphate group. So usually you'll see something like a serine or a tyrosine or glutamate. Those are things that you could transfer a phosphate group to. Then you transfer that phosphate from the enzyme to whatever your substrate is. So in this case, we're taking glutamate and we are making it into glutamine. So you can actually use this glutamyl phosphate to uh, make glutamine because now it's activated. And you can use uh, NH3. So that can replace the phosphate group and you can make glutamine. Now, you're not required to know this exact um, mechanism, but understand that we're doing a group transfer here, not just hydrolysis. The first step is always activating an amino acid residue on an enzyme, and then the second step is displacing whatever that is and replacing it with whatever functional group you care to. So there is kind of a bar for separating high energy compounds and low energy compounds. We said there's a lot of biological phosphate compounds, but there's a difference in terms of how much energy they release. We've got low energy compounds, which have, you know, uh, some energy associated with them, but 
they're less they have a less negative delta g so negative 25 kilojoules per mole is kind of the bar if you have if you release more than that negative 30 negative 50 then you're a high energy compound if you you know negative 20 negative 10 then you're low energy So because we have a compound that's got a phosphate on it, we can actually use these things. We can use a phosphorylated compound and couple the breaking down of that compound with making something else. So if we use, say, PEP, that phosphoenopyruvate, and water, and we cut off that phosphate group and make pyruvate, that's a, a reaction that is highly exergonic. We can couple that with something that is endergonic, like taking a inorganic phosphate and adding that on to an AT ADP molecule to make ATP. So this is a way that you can use energy and generate energy at the same time by coupling something that's highly exergonic with something that is endergonic like making energy. And this is something that you'll see routinely that very exergonic reactions in metabolic uh, pathways are coupled with energy regeneration, like making ATP or GTP, making NADH, all of these energy molecules. ATP has three phosphate groups, hence triphosphate. And they're labeled gamma, beta, and alpha, with alpha being the closest to the adenosine ring. You can actually have nucleophilic attack of any of these phosphate groups. And there's evidence showing this where you can take a nucleophile that has a, a labeled oxygen. It's a radio labeled oxygen. And you can track where that oxygen is when you're looking at your different um, phosphate products. So you can see where the oxygen is. And if you have, you know, an oxygen that's part of just, it's just part of that phosphate group, then you can say, okay, well, we attack the gamma. Maybe you make a pyrophosphate. Okay, then that means that we can actually do some cleavage here too. So that's just the evidence for it. You don't need to really um, know that, but just know that there's evidence showing you know, that you can do in the lab that shows ATP can actually be attacked at all of its different phosphates, which means that it is ripe for energy. So when you do that cleavage, you can make a variety of different products, right? You can make ADP, which has the diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. You can make AMP, that's monophosphate and what's called pyrophosphate, that two phosphate groups. And sometimes you make the AMP and you transfer that to another group. So that's called adenylation. You'll also potentially see it called ampylation. And that's just for the abbreviation of AMP being added onto something. So that's another method of coupling, you know, exergonic and endergonic reactions. It is also very thermodynamically favorable because again, you're, re you're cutting up these phosphate groups and separating them from themselves so that all that negative charge, that the hindrance of all that negative charge is being lifted. So the hydrolysis of the alpha beta phosphoanhydride bond, which is the one that's closest to the, um, that adenosine, 
releases more energy than just the bond between the the last phosphate the gamma and the middle one the beta So with those group transfer reactions, ATP can provide energy for building all those informational macromolecules like DNA, RNA, and proteins. And it's also used to transport molecules and ions across membranes and against gradients, which is really important. Remember that cells are constantly monitoring their cellular contents. So you're pumping out sodium and potassium you could be pumping hydrogen, all these things, you know, active transport. Active means that it requires some kind of energy, and ATP provides that energy. With hydrolysis of ATP, you also can provide energy for muscle contraction. So if you're like sluggish and everything else, then your body needs to kick it in gear to make some ATP so that your muscles can get moving. We'll talk about this uh, mechanism of nucleoside diphosphate kinase very briefly. So it's a ping pong mechanism, which we didn't cover um, some of the enzyme mechanism names and types in chapter six, because I felt that that was kind of a little bit above our pay grade. But I'm gonna give you this one example. So ping pong mechanism is simply when you kind of, if you think about the game, you know, one person hits it, and then the next person hits it, right? So you've got two paddles. Well, the first paddle for nucleoside diphosphate kinase, you're going to transfer a phosphoryl group from ATP to a histidine in the active site. And you're gonna create what's called a phosphoenzyme intermediate. That's something that you may see um, if you're reading papers that have to do with kinases or phosphorylases. Phosphoenzyme intermediate. It's just an enzyme that has a phosphate attached to one of the active site residues, and it's ready to do some chemistry. The second step, you're going to transfer that phosphoryl group from that histidine to a nucleoside diphosphate acceptor. So it could be something to make um, ATP or GTP or anything like that. So that's what the nucleoside diphosphate kinase does. It takes... Um, a phosphate from ATP and it puts it on something else. So we also have adenylate kinase and creatine kinase. So we'll talk a little bit about what they do. Adenylate kinase lowers the ADP concentration to replenish ATP. So what that means is it takes ADP and it adds a phosphate to it to create ATP. And that happens when you have really high demand for ATP that your body's like, whoa, 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 okay, need more ATP stat. Same thing happens with guanylate kinase because GTP is also, um, it's energy currency just like ATP. Then we've also got creatine kinase, which uses that phosphocreatine that's hanging out in the cell to replenish ATP really rapidly as well. Other organisms will use phosphagens, which are kind of phosphocreatine-like molecules, as the same thing, okay? That's it for this one. We just covered sections two and three of chapter 13. Make sure that you tune in for the second chapter 13 video, which will cover the remainder of the chapter, uh, sections four and five. Thanks for watching and stay safe.